Awesome. We are, we're in a series of messages uh, as we start this year called Stuff Christians Do. We're talking about some of the stuff that Christians do. There's stuff that we all do, and I hope more and more we can give a reason why we do the stuff that we do. I hope like on the daily, the way you spend your time, your money, your, your energy, I hope you're able to say, well, this is why I do that thing. And yet there's some stuff that we all do that if really pushed to it, we'd be like, yeah, I don't know why we do it that way. For instance, the UNO rules in your house are a little bit different. And you're not sure why, but you know that you're right. And you play with someone else like, what? You don't double up the pickup twos? Are you crazy? <laughs> or the Monopoly rules, they're a little bit different in your house. You don't know why, but, but if you really did like dig in and find out, it's probably because grandpa cheated. Like, no, we do banking differently in Monopoly in our house because your grandpa was a cheater. You know, he was, he was skimming off the bank and a little off the top, making up for those depression years, and he was taken back from the bank, those high, you know, inflation years. I don't know. We have reasons why we do some things that we do, and what we're trying to look at is what are the basic things that Christians do, and are we doing them right? Like, like, are we corporately, and am I individual, am I doing the things that Christians do well? Or am I just following in a pattern that can't be defended? Maybe this has never been your story, and I hope it's the case, but I have at times been part of communities where I can't give you an answer. Why do we do that thing we do? I'm, I'm actually not sure why so much energy is put toward this unspoken rule that no one knows where or why it came to be. We wanna to look to the word and make sure that the things we do align with the purposes of God. Can we do that together? Uh, and so if you would, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter one, and we're gonna hear from Peter, who really, he was a model of what a life that's changed by the mercy of God looks like. I mean, Peter, who was a close friend of Jesus, epically failed in friendship towards Jesus. Like he was a remarkable failure in his ability to, to befriend Jesus. So much so, like, like he, was a, he was a passionate friend. He's like, Jesus, I will never turn my back on you. All these other guys, like he said, while all Jesus' other besties were around, he's like, all these guys might fail, but I won't. And they're like, Peter, shut up. And Jesus goes, oh, actually, you are going to. He's like, no, I won't. He goes, well, yeah, like you will today. Three times. And all the other friends hear it. And I know, I just know, because I know what groups of guys are like. They all went, ooh, and held each other back. I don't know why that happens like in every sporting event. Someone gets crossed over, and all of a sudden, everyone hold, it's like hold them back, right? They're all like, oh. So all the other disciples are behind Peter, like, oh, it's going to happen. And then it did, and they probably weren't quite as excited when it did, because it was kind of ugly. Like publicly, people just said, wait, you're Jesus' friend, right? And he's like, how dare you? That guy, I would never be his friend. And Jesus can hear him. Like Peter epically failed. But he also was remarkably reinstated by the, the mercy of God. Anyone in the room, have you ever epically failed? Okay, some of you, by not putting up your hand, just lied in church. That's an epic failure. Come on, anyone ever epically failed? So, so, so Peter, similar to us, knows what imperfection looks like. And then similar to us, he has this extended opportunity to receive so much mercy from Jesus. Because his last interaction with Jesus before he went to the cross was just epic failure. The last things they're talking about, he's like, I'll never turn my back on you. And Jesus goes, you will. And then he does, and then Jesus dies. I don't know if you've ever felt like your epic failure. It's like, well, everything's over now. I sinned. And that's the way it's always gonna be. 
But praise God, he conquered death in the grave. And he rose again. And in rising again, there's these women who come to his grave. They find it empty. Jesus is like, hey, I'm gonna come back later. Just go tell the guys. Go tell Peter. Isn't that awesome? How good is Jesus? He's like, I don't want him living with this remorse anymore. And so Peter and John, they run to the graveside and they find it empty. And Peter's like, it's cool he's not dead, but I still messed up so bad. And the first time they interact together is Jesus calling him out. He goes, hey, Peter, do you love me? Then I I want you to be the one who leads this thing. I'm gonna ascend to heaven, prepare a place for all humanity who ever called me. I want you to lead this thing. And 40 days later, Peter goes from the guy who denied Jesus to the guy who stands up boldly and represents Jesus. How cool is that? Come on, that is a remarkable story of life change. Epic failure followed by remarkable mercy. So so if Peter is trying to give some instruction to us on how to do this thing right, I kind of want to listen to him. You know what I mean? I I don't listen to Peter because he was perfect. Because if if Peter is a perfect representation, I'm like, hey, dude, you don't want it's like to be me. I epically fail. I actually listen to Peter because he's a failure, because he's experienced falling short, and because he's had this, this promise applied to his life. So Peter says this, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us. Through these, he's given us very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world. And then he gives this instruction. This is acting as a bit of a grid for us over these next week. He says, for this reason, make every effort. Can someone say effort? Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge uh, self-control, to your self-control perseverance, to your perseverance godliness, to your godliness mutual affection and to your mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in ever-increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says it's possible to know Jesus and have no effect. It's possible to know Jesus and they live an unproductive life. He's like, don't be that guy. Because I know what it feels like to be Jesus' friend and fall short. I wanna help you so that you can actually see effectiveness in your life. How many people would rather be effective than ineffective? Come on, how many people, I, I want my life to be productive. I'm already tired, I'm already working hard. It might as well be for something, are you with me? So Peter goes, hey, if you're gonna do this, this, this Christian life thing, here's some stuff Christians do. First of all, we start with faith. That's why last week we looked at how to grow your faith, growing our faith in prayer. We've started 21 days of prayer that we are being reminded on the regular. I just wanna bring these things to the Lord. And what is it we pray about? Our weaknesses. Man, I'm super weak. It's the main reason I pray. If I had no weakness, I don't know what I would talk to God about. Like, man, God, we're awesome, aren't we? That's pretty cool. Okay, see ya. It's my weaknesses that I weaponize into prayer. Every time I I consider my own weakness, I'm like, well, that would be a good reason to pray because in my weakness, God's power is doing its best work. Well, today I wanna talk about goodness. How do we add to that and put effort towards goodness? Now, Now, if we're not careful, we would read it this way, that we should just go find problems and solve problems, which would be pretty good, wouldn't it? that we should engage more frequently in just, you know, we gotta do some good things. We gotta figure out what good is, but how do we do good things if we don't know what good is? In fact, sometimes I hear this rhetoric that you just need to do what's good for you. Do what's good for you. But if what's good for you is punching me in the face, you know what I mean? Like Jory's like, hey, it just it felt really good to punch you, man. I'm like, well, that's good for you, I guess. If good is subjective, then it's not good. So so here's what I could do for you today. I could describe what good is. I could try to describe it to you. 
description to describe something means to write it down. Scribe is writing. So to describe is to write something down, to, to give definition to it, to explain it. I could prescribe for you some, some practices and habits that we could engage in. To prescribe is to write before, right? So, so here's the interaction with you and your doctor. You go into the doctor and you describe what's going wrong. You write it down and make it clear. And then he or she prescribes to you beforehand, if you do this, it will get better. And I think a lot of times we engage in goodness this way. We describe what good things would look like, and then we prescribe some good habits that would help us do good things. And, and if we're not careful, we exclude God from that picture, and we just say, hey, we've got to be good people. I'm, making, I'm just doing my best to be a good person. Sometimes when we talk about others, we're like, oh, man, she's a really good person. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy, really good guy. But in the end, you can be a good person by the description of others and still be ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of, of the Lord. Because we are not prescribing, here's 10 good things to do today. I'm not even describing what good things would do. I don't know if you've ever heard this. I've had sometimes people like, hey, we should do more random acts of kindness. Have you ever heard that, that phrase, random acts of kindness? The thing I love about it is usually people are like, hey, this Tuesday, 6.30, I'll meet you at Tim Hortons, and we're gonna do some random acts of kindness. And you're like, hey, Jeff, the moment you planned the time and place, it wasn't random. You know what I mean? Like, like, like planning to do good is good, but this is not what Peter's talking about when he says, add to your faith goodness. He doesn't, he's not saying, if you believe that, that God exists, go be a good person. Because there's like this fundamental gap there that I don't know what good is except for God. So, so we're not talking about describing something. We're not talking about prescribing something. Instead, I want to talk about ascribing something. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of, of Psalm chapter 29. Psalm chapter 29, here the, the psalmist is writing, uh, and he's challenging us to think about good in a different sort of way. Psalm chapter 29, let me read this to you. It says this, ascribe to the Lord, all you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord the glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. To ascribe, unlike describing something, unlike prescribing something, when we ascribe, we're not writing down or writing before, we're writing to. We're giving a description to. We are attributing a quality to a person and saying, oh, that, that one was yours. You did that. And here David says, if you want to know what good is, we need to look to the Lord. We need to look to God and say, he's the standard of what's good. So we are, are, are giving language to the qualities we see in God and saying, that's what worth looks like. He goes, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. I want to make the argument today that to live a life of goodness is not about engaging in a bunch of acts. To live a life of goodness is not about just giving a description to the things that are happening around us. It's actually turning our eyes to the Lord and saying, that's what good is. That's what I'm trying to be. That's the, the standard that I am aspiring towards. I'm not looking at my actions and going, that was a good action, that one not so good. I'm going, this is what good looks like. And then to give God the glory due his name is what worship is. We worship God because he's worthy of our worship. A life of goodness is a life where our focus is on what is good. A life of goodness is a life of worship. So he goes on to say this, describe to the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then he says this, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The, the Lord breaks into pieces the cedars of Lebanon. 
He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oak and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry glory. Did you, did you catch a theme there? The voice. Man, you guys are good. Amazing. You see, if we're, we're going to ascribe to the Lord the glory is due his name, and we're going to worship God, for, for who he is and what is good about him. I, let me tell you this. First of all, the, the words of God are worthy. God's words are worthy. What he says is distinctive. What he says is better than what anyone else says. His words are the best. In fact, so often when Jesus is, is teaching, there's times where he's saying things and people are like, whoa. I've, ne- I've never heard that before. That's crazy. Jesus says, I know you've heard it said, like, don't murder, but I'm telling you something different. Don't even hate your brother or sister in your heart. I'm raising the standard, and they're like, whoa, nobody said that before. Like like Jesus, who in a storm just stood up in a boat and said, peace, be still, and the storm stopped. Like, he's got different type of words, guys. His words make him worthy of our praise. When you look at the word of God, you study scripture and you look at the word and you understand it for what it's saying, you end up going, oh my goodness. God is good. Man, God is good. That's what good is. That's what good is. Like like good is not just good intentions. It's actually his words that are worthy. I, I worship God because of what he says. Number two, the the, the psalm goes on to say this, the Lord sits enthroned over the floods. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. Not only are God's words worthy, God's ways are worthy. I love this. It's like, man, God, you know why he he gets our worship? Because he's just sitting. He's just above it all. That's just the way of God. Like God doesn't get stressed out in the things we're going through. He's just sitting on his throne. He's king over what? It all. I worship God. Know what's good about him? Not just his words, but his ways. His ways. How hard would it be to worship a stressed out God? Can you just follow with me on on how bizarre that would be? If we came into church and we're like, man, I really need to encourage God. He's probably feeling terrible about how the world's going right now. And I need to build this guy up. Because I, I need him. I need him to come through for me, but whew, he's got to be stressed. No, no, the ways of God. He's just, just peaceful over it all. He's sitting on the throne. When I understand, like, the position of where God is to where I am, I'm like, oh, man, God is good. Man, he deserves the best of, of my worship. His ways are worthy. His words are worthy. His ways are worthy. And then number three, God's works are worthy. Look at what it says. It says, the Lord gives strength to his people and God blesses his people with peace. That's the work of God. The work of God, how powerful it is that he gives strength and he gives peace. How many people could attest that you've experienced the strength of God? And you're like, man, it doesn't make sense, but I have this endurance to go through what I'm going through. I look back and I, don't, I can't believe I got here if not for the strength of God. How many people could, could testify that you've experienced the peace of God? And you're like, that makes no sense. I was sitting with somebody yesterday for a meal. We were talking about transition and things that can be stressful. And, and we're eating a, a really good Cuban sandwich. And through bites of my sandwich, I'm like, well, you know, life's hard, right? And she's like, whoa. I've never heard it put that way. I'm like, really? <laughs> never? <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, that's, that's profound. Thanks for saying that. But here's what was happening. As we were talking about things being hard, instead of stress being the response, there was peace. Peace. So I'm talking about hard things. I'm like, life's hard, but hey, God's got it. He's going to help us, and he's going to give us strength in this. And it wasn't the content, life is hard. 
It was the contentment over it all, the peace that they're like, wow, that's true. Life is hard, but we will be okay. What's happening? God's giving peace. God's ministering his peace to our hearts. That's why I worship God. I worship God because he's worth it. I pray because I'm weak, but, but I don't want to only ever pray. I also want to worship because I want my life to be exposed to goodness. How about you? You can focus on the negative or you can focus on what's great. I want to expose my life to what's great. I want my, my focus and attention to be on what is good. That's why Paul says this, whatever is noble and good and pure and lovely, think on these things. Like expose yourself to what is good. This is not a call to go describe good actions or prescribe this type of life leads to this type of result. It's ascribing to the Lord the glory that's due his name. Let that standard get within us that this is what good looks like. Now, now if you would, turn your attention to the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse one. Here Paul says this, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies. I've heard people try to describe this scripture this way. They're like, our bodies are a living sacrifice. That's why you need to hit the gym. You gotta get on that elliptical because your body is a sacrifice and God deserves your best. Interesting application. It's great when it's like the influencer slash you know, physical trainer and that's their, their, their go-to. But that's not what this verse means. What it means is our entire life, everything that we would qualify as our life is an opportunity to worship God. Offer your whole body as a living sacrifice. I love that it's defined as living because that means moment by moment, as long as there's still breath in my lungs, my whole life is an opportunity to do good. And doing good it is reflecting back to Jesus. This is what I'm learning from you good is, and I want to do that. So if your words are worthy of praise, I want to speak the type of words that bless you. And if your way of living, I love this, Jesus says to the disciples, he's like, so what do you guys think? You're going to follow me? And they're like, yeah, you're the only one who's got the words. No one else has the words you have. And then there's this time where he's, he's healing people and they're like, he does everything well. What a statement of excellence, isn't it? That the more they're around Jesus, they're like, he does everything well. He does weather well. He cures blind people well. He answers hard questions well. I mean, this guy, he's a good cook. I don't know, like they're just like everything well. They couldn't think of anything about him, just his ways. Like man, there's just a goodness about being with Jesus. I think this is why people flock to him. I think this is why kids love to hang out with him. I think this is why foreigners in a society where they should have felt shunned were like, no, I, I'm safe to talk to him. This is why people who were unclean were like, I think he wants to hang out with me. This is why tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes were like, you wanna come hang at my house? Why, because all his ways were good. And his works, my goodness. I used to read this, this scripture, Romans 12, this way. Everyone was going to say, we read this sacrifice. This is worship. But God, you got it. <laughs> no pain, no gain. You know, I want to be a great worshiper. I want my life to be a worship, so it's got to hurt. <laughs> and if I'm going to do what God wants me to do, I'm going to hate every moment of it. That's, what's, that's, that's not what this scripture means. Here's where the focal point should be. In view of God's mercy. That's the focal point. I urge you, first and foremost, before you try to be a good person, please stop. You're gonna fall so far short. Peter did. That's not gonna help you. I love you, Jesus, so I'll be a good person. No, you won't. You're gonna fail today. The story of Peter's friendship with Jesus was not how hard he tried, it's just how much Jesus loved him. So in view of God's mercy, then offering our body as a living sacrifice becomes easy. 
If doing the thing that Jesus is calling you to do seems too hard, you're looking at it from the wrong direction. You're looking at it from the direction of cost, not from the direction of the benefit. See, the benefit is closeness with the only one who's good. The only one who's the standard of good. He wants closeness with you. He wants intimate relationship with you. So yes, there's a a cost. There's surrendering to him, but the benefit is closeness with the only one who's good. In view of God's mercy, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So pastor, you're saying I should worship more? Yes. Okay, I'll come to church nine minutes earlier. I'll catch those first two songs. I usually miss them. Not a great singer, so don't know what I'm adding to the atmosphere. But I'll try harder. I'll sing a few more songs. I, I don't think the description of biblical worship is that reductive. It's not just singing. Again, I could describe to you some things the Bible say about worship. The Bible says that, that we can worship God through singing. It's like a fitting thing for us to do. It actually says that we should all make a joyful noise. It doesn't say, you know, can you hit a high C? Harmonize before the Lord. Yes, be skillful, but make a joyful noise. The Bible also says that we can clap our hands. That's a way of worshiping God. I do that sometimes. It says kneeling would be a way we could worship God. That's cool. You know what the Bible says? There's this one part that says that when we twirl. I don't do that one very often, I'm gonna be honest. But, but I, I think I can worship God on the sky train and I'm never gonna twirl on the sky train. I'm not just gonna be the crazy clapper guy on a sky train. I'll be like, okay, don't worry guys, I'm just worshiping God over here. Worship is not just music. It's not just music. Now, I was thinking about this. So, so if all worship was was singing songs, and, and let's just kind of go through the math here. You're like, well, I'm gonna come to church every Sunday this year, which you're not. I know you. But let's say you do. You're gonna come every week this year. And you're gonna, you're gonna come, you, okay, you're probably not gonna come early but you'll do your best to catch most of it. So let's say it's, I don't know, 15 minutes on a Sunday, once a week. That's 12 hours a year right there. That's literally what it would be, 12 hours in a year. 12 hours in a year, half of one day in a year, if you came every single Sunday and tried to catch most of the singing. If worship is only singing, it is not a very big part of our life. Like we're talking about like teeth brushing level. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not a very big part, 12 hours in our year, but, but we might not come every week and we might get caught up in a conversation in the lobby. So we're going down from there. No, no, no. I listened to a few songs on Spotify from time to time. Okay, but what are we talking about? Worship has to be bigger than that. It's gotta be our whole life, right? I think what we do when we gather together is more like practice than it is like game day. Like, like it's learning some new skills. It's going through some, some reps. It is helpful. Don't get me wrong. It's helpful to worship when Adriel's on the keyboard. If he could just follow me around in life, I might worship more frequently. I'm like, he's like, Pastor, I can sense you're getting stressed. And then there's some pads that come in. I'm like, Ooh, uh, you're right, Adriel. Like I will focus back. That would help. That, that would help. You know what's helpful for me to worship? Words on a screen. I'm like, I didn't know words to say, but those ones, hallelujah, what a faithful God you are. Whew, I couldn't say it better myself. That helps. It also helps that the person behind me sounds awesome. Right? But, but that can't be worship. This is just practice. You know, yesterday there was a, uh, a football game, Kansas City Chiefs versus the Miami Dolphins, okay? And uh, it was uh, apparently the second coldest recorded NFL game in history. It was like minus 30 Fahrenheit plus wind. Like it was cold, cold. And, uh, and they say it was about the second coldest game. And, and uh, you, so you're talking like, like uh, Patrick Mahomes' helmet cracked. He, hit, he went helmet to helmet and his helmet cracked because it was that cold. Like cold, cold. I still love that there was guys who were wearing short sleeves like I'm, I'm good. <laughs> like I cold plunge. I, I, was, I was born for this, right? 
So, so interestingly, the Miami Dolphins, they wanted to really prepare for this game, but they live in Miami. So, so they, in their practice facility, guess what they did to get ready? They turned the air conditioning on full. So the weather in Kansas City was minus 30. They turned their air conditioning down all the way to 50 degrees. It's like, that's an 80 degree separation. It's, it's barely helping at all. I kind of think that when we worship corporately, it's practice, guys. We're just pumping the AC in here, but we know this is not the real thing. Real worship is, is Monday and Tuesday and on the weekend. Real worship is how we live our lives. If worship is just singing, then shame on us for ever leaving a room like this, right? If this is the only way we can honor God with our life, this is what true and acceptable worship is, is get in more singing song environments. There are friend groups that think that way, like who's bringing their acoustic? If we're getting together, worship will happen, you know? His love will never fail and it will never give up on us and we're singing it over and over. But, but worship has to be bigger than this. If, if our whole life is worship, it's gotta be bigger than songs. Let me show you one, one scripture where Jesus speaks to this. One scripture, I wanna urge you in, in your week this week, you can do this. We can put this into, into practice. We can make a decision to put this into practice. Mark chapter 12, I'm gonna take just a few moments and bring this to, to an actionable conclusion for us. Mark chapter 12, in verse 28, there's a scribe who's talking to Jesus. Remember, describing something is writing it down, prescribing something is writing it before, ascribing something is writing it to, and saying, God, I just want to describe back to you how awesome you are. This guy's job is to be a scribe. So there's probably a little bit of all. He's describing what God is like. He's reminding people to ascribe to the Lord. He's giving prescriptive life hacks. Here's what you should do. And then, then he says this. He's got Jesus in the room, and so this teacher of the law came and he heard them debating, and he's noticing that Jesus had given them good answers. He asked this question, of all your commands, which one is the most important? What an awesome question, don't you think? You've got God in the room. You should probably ask him what matters the most to him, right? How many married people in the room? You know, married in the room? Okay, I just want to, like, have you ever done something for your spouse that they don't care about? Right? And you've done it like, I'm doing this for you, babe. And like, I don't care about that. That's not a thing that matters to me at all. Thank you. And you're like, you're expecting it to make a huge difference, but it's not something. You should probably ask them what matters the most to them. If the purpose is to express love to them, then you should figure out what is loving to them. This is what this guy's doing. It's a great question. Hey, God... What matters the most to you? I know all of the things that, that we think might matter, but, but I've got you here, and I'd be crazy to not ask you this question. What matters the most to you? What's the top thing on your mind? And Jesus responds to this quick, great question. He says, here's the most important thing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher. Also a good idea, if God tells you something, you should just agree with him, because he's right. But he's so affirming. Well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one. He's like, yeah, I know I am. There's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than every other sacrifice. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said this, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from that point on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Like they, they, it was like this mic drop moment where everyone's like, oh, this guy gets it. You know what I'm saying? See, there's a lot of us, we strive to sacrifice things for God, he's like, I actually just want you to love me. And to love me is to obey what I'm asking you to do. So please, stop thinking that burning out for me is pleasing me. It's not. Please, stop thinking that all the, the extra tasks you're doing somehow impress me. They don't. 
please don't, don't, don't try to reduce my work in your life to a to-do list. It's not. All, all I want, the most important thing, just, just love me with your life. People, sometimes they would describe themselves like, I'm a worshiper. What do they mean? Probably that they're a singer or they play an instrument. But we're all worshipers. We worship something. And our, our lives say what we worship. We worship something. Jesus is like, either you're going to love me with everything or you'll love something else more than me. But if you want your Christian life to be effective and productive, this is the only thing I want. So if you, even if you don't take notes, would you, you know, write these things down? I think they'll help us. This is stuff we can do this week. Worship with your heart. Number one, worship with your heart. What's your heart? It's your emotions. Maybe you've wondered if your emotions matter. Maybe your emotions are so erratic. You're like, I probably shouldn't trust them. But Jesus validates the importance of our emotions by saying, you can love me with those. You can actually find a way to worship when you're sad. Look in scripture. It's all over there. You can worship when you're angry. David does it really well. You can worship when you're offended, when you're lonely, when you're confused. Jesus said, I don't want you to, to, like, I just gotta get myself calmed down first, or I just have to feed my own emotions first, and then I gotta worship. Worship me through the filter of those emotions. Worship with your heart. Your emotions matter to God. Number two, worship with your soul. Worship with your soul. What's your soul? Well, your soul is the, the convictions that you have. Your soul is the person that you've determined to be. Your soul doesn't always align with your emotions, but your emotions definitely speak into the formation of your soul and how you see the world. But your soul is the person who's like, hey, I, my emotions say this person's the worst, don't forgive them, but I've determined to be a forgiving person. That's your soul engaging. And Jesus says, I want your soul to, to love me. I want your soul to understand, here's how, how Jesus would respond, I want to do that thing. So worship me with your soul. Number three, worship with your mind. What's your mind? Well, in the, in the Greek language, the word used would be described this way. It's the, the central hub where all your senses are bringing information to. It's how you experience the world. Your mind is stimulated by your senses processing information. And he goes, I want you with that thing to, to worship me, to love me. Have you ever thought a thought? You're like, I don't know where that came from. Come on, make sure I don't feel like I'm all alone. Have you never thought that thought? Okay, have you ever thought, you're like, whoa, that's a dark thought. That's a confusing thought. I mean, thoughts are us processing external information that's coming. You see an image and you have a thought. Man, you smell some food and you have a thought. You feel the cold temperature outside and you have a thought. Jesus says, I want you to learn with, with your mind to, to think about me. That's why... Paul says this, you actually can take your thoughts captive because those thoughts that aren't drawing you closer to God, stop thinking them. This doesn't mean stop having them. It means stop pondering them. And when you have them, go, nope. Not going down that train of thought. I don't like where it leads. So, so we contend with our, our, our mind. How do you love the Lord with your, your heart? You're honest about what you're feeling. How do you love the Lord with your soul? You align the actions of your life with the convictions that you claim to have. Don't be the person who's like, I know it's wrong, but I'm still doing it. You're not loving the Lord. Do not call yourself a worshiper while also saying, but I'm not going to. That's what loving God with your, your soul looks like. No other sacrifice makes up for that. Love the Lord with your mind. It means when these thoughts are pulling me away from God, I'm just gonna arrest my thoughts and set my mind on things above, not on earthly things. Number, number four, love the Lord with your strength. Worship God with your strength. How do you worship God with your strength? Your strength is effort and energy. 
It, it means it might require some work. And we think of God, we've reduced him to this. He's so nice, he probably wants us to always be comfortable. That's not the story of humanity. Work for it. Put energy. Jesus says this, hey, if you're weary, I do want you to find rest. Here's how you're gonna find it. Do my thing. When you do my thing, you have my power. Come join with me in the work that matters to me. Take my yoke upon your back and learn from me. Come do my thing, I'll teach you how to do it, and you will be more rested than you've ever thought possible. So we love the Lord with our heart. We love the Lord with our soul. We love the Lord with our mind. We love the Lord with our strength. Number five, love the Lord or worship God with your community. See, Jesus says this. I, I, look, I can't just give you one. I know you asked one question. Let me give you two answers. Here's what matters the most to me. Heart, soul, mind, strength, neighbor. Because in a lot of these things, you're like, it's hard to figure out, was that a mind thing or a soul thing? Is this a thought thing or a conviction thing? Why is it hard? Because we're integrated whole, aren't we? It's not like, well, this is, this is only gonna require my, my strength, but not my heart. I kind of need passion behind what I'm gonna exert strength for because I'm an integrated whole. But Jesus says you're not only integrated in and of yourself, you're integrated with people. It's impossible to love me as a solo act, how are you interacting with others? That tells you all you need to know about what you think of me. Does that make sense? So I can't say, God, I love you with all my strength. So next time I'm in worship, I'm hot till my calves burn. He's like, no, no, make an effort, exert effort loving that person in your life. I know they drive you crazy. But aren't I good? Like, keep your eyes on me, not on the people who are driving. Keep my, your eyes on me. God, I'm gonna love you with my soul. So I gotta say no to some things. I gotta say no to some things my emotions want. Because I'm convicted to what you've called me to. We're an integrated whole. We love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, strength, and neighbor. It affects the way we live. So if this was just prescriptive, guys, we're gonna become better worshipers. I'll see you next Sunday. Come early, bring your singing voice. It's just too reductive. It's like before the day is done, certainly before the week is over, love will be required of you in your strength. Love will be demanded of our souls. Do we love ourselves or the Lord? You know what I'm saying? Love will be required on how we interact with the people in our world, in our life. Sometimes I think we just say things. I heard a conversation in a coffee shop today and this one girl said to the other, she goes, everyone is always asking me about my eyelash serum. And I just heard it and I'm thinking like, it's not true. Everyone isn't always asking you about your eyelash serum. And then what happened? The girl across the oh yeah, I was noticing it. That is nice. I'm like, oh, it's just compliment fishing. You know, sometimes I think we do this like, God, I love you. And we're just comp like, we, we, we hope that he'll answer back like, oh, I love you too. He already loves us, guys. Let's not just say stuff to God. Let's put it into action. You, you wanna grow in your relationship with God? Then, then don't just try to do more good things. Just with eyes on him, live for him. Heart, soul, mind, strength, neighbor. In an integrated whole in our life. Can we do that together? Man, I know we can. I know we can. We will be in uh, environments that stress us out and demand patience of us, won't we? I was on a flight this week, delayed seven hours. Four of them I was on the plane for. multiple medical emergencies happening. They're like, are there any doctors in the place? It was interesting, you just see the way different people react. They all become experts. They're like, I think what's happening probably is, so, you know, I'm like, are you an aerial, like an aeronautical engineer, Cheryl? Your ideas don't matter right now. You know what I'm saying? Like we're gonna be in situations that, that push us to say, what, what kind of person am I? So is God being worshiped with heart, soul, mind, strength, and neighbor? If not, then we got some work to do. 
because we want to have effective lives, amen? I want my life to be productive in my faith, don't you? I want my life to actually make a difference. I don't just want to exist, I want to live. I think you do too, why don't we pray? Jesus, thank you for our church. Thank you for the people in this room. I praise you, God, that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. If we have a heart, then we have an opportunity to worship you. If we have a soul, then we've got this opportunity to worship you. And with all our mind, and with all our strength, and in every human interaction with our neighbor, we can worship you. And so I pray for courage to do that. That our, our quest wouldn't be to be good compared to other people. Or wouldn't it be just to be good compared to how we used to be? Or wouldn't it just to be like well-intended people? No, we wanna be people who are good compared to what you are like reflecting you, ascribing to you. You've got the words, you've got the ways, you've got the works, and so in light of that, of course, our whole life wants to worship you. Help us in that, God. Give us courage, not just to be well-intended, but to follow through. Noble people make noble plans, and by noble works, they experience blessing.